Um, but I would just like to again extend our thanks uh, to Noel and the book club as well as the AC Hunter Library for uh, allowing us this uh, really great opportunity. And with that, uh, I'd like to invite Laura Jackson up to give you a bit of a background about the Lawrence Jackson Writers Award. And uh, from there, Laura will announce the 2013 recipient. So, Laura? This year's winner is Elizabeth DeMariaffi. Some of you ha may have met her already or have run into her in connection with the uh, Breakwater Books. <coughs> Aren't you just talking about having run into somebody, one of you, of, <coughs> just the other day? I'm just going to read a little smidge here. Elizabeth de Mariaffi is the author of a collection of short stories, How to Get Along with Women, which was long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize and shortlisted for the Relit Award in 2013. Her first poetry chapbook, Letter on St. Valentine's Day, was published in 2009. She's currently working on her first novel, The Devil You Know, which will be released in the spring of 2015. Her poetry and short fiction, and she's obviously versatile in her writing skills, have been widely published in magazines across Canada. Um, I won't list all the magazines, but uh, you can see them if you'd like. She's also one of the wild minds behind the highly original Toronto Poetry Vendors, a small press that sells single poems by established Canadian poets through toony vending machines. <laughs> That's fascinating in, its, in itself. Imagine people paying toonies for poems. That's very encouraging. Originally from Toronto, Ontario, Elizabeth holds a Master of uh, MFA Fine Arts, right? Fine Arts. Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing from the University of Guelph. She currently works at mar as Marketing Coordinator for Breakwater Books and is now based in St. John's where she lives with the poet George Murray and their combined brood of four children making them Canlet's answer to the Brady Bunch. <laughs> <laughs> and I also a uh, spiffy card before that you can frame and, and at the same time the award. And congratulations. Well, I really want to thank um, Laura. I really want to thank you for even setting up something like this. I had no idea it existed and it was such a a like, tremendous, lovely surprise for me um, when I got the call from Josh. And in general, um, I always try to just make it really clear to people who don't, you know, for, for everyone out there who's not trying to make a go of things in an artistic practice, just to, you know, let other people know, let everyone you know how important the granting process is. Grants are essential to writers. Um, this particular grant from uh, the Newfoundland and Labrador Arts Council is absolutely the thing. It was the decision maker that let me rejig my work hours, so I'm working part-time now. I'm focusing on my novel, and the first book that I wrote, which ended up being long-listed for the Giller Prize, was very generously funded by, with a grant from the Ontario Arts Council. And I, you know, I find that, um, that not everyone really understands the, the concreteness of that, but you know, there's a, there's a, I was a single mother at the time I wrote that first book. There was a concrete um, cash injection that happened at that time that made it so that I could sit and write for a few hours every day. And without that, we won't have books. That's all there is to it because, um, you know, I often say this about one of my best girlfriends in the world is an assistant crown attorney, and she really enjoys being a crown attorney. It's a thing that she went to school for, and she's smart, and she does a great job at it. And on the weekend, she spends time with her family, and she gardens, and she does all those things. And for those of us who are trying to work a full-time job and maintain an artistic practice, um, it can get very exhausting and, and very frustrating at times when you're sort of always trying to make ends meet and then spending your weekends trying to do that catch-up and then feeling like you're shortchanging your, you're either short shortchanging your family or you're shortchanging your artistic practice. Um, so without belaboring the point, thank you, Arts Councils of Canada, because honestly, you have no idea how the novel, the real time of the novel is 1993 in Toronto, and um, the protagonist, or the speaker in this case, is a 21-year-old 
um, who has just dropped out of journalism school to be a reporter. So she's doing that, and she has a past story from her childhood that's somewhat sad. So this, this first chapter actually takes place in 1982, and it's a little bit of background to her life. Um, and I guess all that's important to know about the book is that she is a reporter with this past story that will come back to haunt her. Um, but of course, the story takes place in 1993 in February, which is really the moment of Paul Bernardo's arrest. So that's very weighing very heavily um, on the place at that time. So this is uh, chapter one. I'll just read a few pages. On May 23rd, 1982, the week after she turned 11, my friend Leanne Gagnon took the subway to St. George Station to practice running the 200 at Varsity Track and never came home. Sometimes I think I was supposed to meet her there. Sometimes what I think is we had a plan to meet. I used to run relay with her, never fast enough to be last leg, but they put me in second or third. Only that day I didn't go, and Leanne stood around on the corner waiting for me until whatever ne happened next came along and happened. I had a few therapists and my parents tell me this isn't true but it's a hard notion to shake. No one knows if she got to the track at all. Maybe someone talked her into getting off the train early, or maybe she never even made it onto the platform. Kids didn't carry phones back then. These were the days before Paul Bernardo or the Scarborough Rapist. The next winter, a little girl called Sharon Morningstar would go missing from an annex park. They found her a few weeks later stuffed in a fridge. People still remember that time as the moment the city changed. Up till then, Toronto was pretty safe. We used to ride bikes through Mount Pleasant Cemetery all the way up to Yonge Street and come home in the dark. They made you carry a quarter in case you needed to call home. When I see it in my mind, Leanne is standing around near the track entrance at the corner of Bloor and Devonshire, waiting for someone, me, and that's when the guy notices her. He probably told her he had some running tips. He probably said he was a track coach and could help her with her time. That's how the cops painted for us, painted it for us later on. In a couple of days right after Leanne disappeared, my friend Cecilia Chan and I used to sit at the piano in her mother's kindergarten class after school and tell each other how it happened, how it was raining and Bloor Street was empty and a long black car pulled up and pulled Leanne inside. Then Cecilia played Jesus Loves Me on the piano. That's the only song we taught her at Chinese Sunday school. The other thing I picture, sometimes, is my bedroom closet in my parents' old house on Vesper Drive. The year before, I'd grown a plate of penicillin in the back of the closet, hidden, so my mother wouldn't know what I was up to and come and throw it away. Penicillin is just bread and mold. Alexander Fleming was a slob who left old sandwiches lying around his desk, and then poof, some mold got into his petri dish when he was away on vacation and killed a bunch of bacteria. He made another startling wonder drug discovery when his nose accidentally dripped into a different petri dish. You never hear about the stuff Fleming discovered on purpose. <laughs> I was growing the penicillin for a science fair, but once the bread got moldy, I couldn't prove it had antibiotic properties because I didn't have ready access to bacteria. The closet was good and dark, though, easy to hide stuff in. When I say I picture the closet, that's also because of the cops. When Leanne didn't come home for dinner, her dad drove down to Varsity to get her, but no one was there and the gate was locked. I guess he drove around for a few hours before they thought of calling the police. Everyone figured she was lost. I went to bed not knowing a thing, but later my parents told me her school picture was on the 11 o'clock news. <coughs> right away I had a terrible feeling, my mother said, right here. She pushed a fist into the soft part of her stomach. We were getting ready for lunch when she told me this, so she stood there with her fist in her stomach for 10 or 20 seconds, and then went back to setting the table. The police called our house at 2 in the morning. My parents didn't want to wake me up, but the cop on the other end of the line wouldn't hang up until he talked to me. They had a class list, and they were going through it alphabetically. I wasn't special. They were calling everyone. Leanne was my best friend, and I wanted to be the first one they called. If anyone knew where Leanne was, it would be me, right? How could they not know that I should be first? What they wanted to know was if Leanne was hiding in my closet. Did I know she was going downtown to practice for the track meet? Did I say I would meet her and then forget? This seemed possible, even though I wouldn't be 11 until November and I wasn't allowed to take the subway alone. I also wasn't allowed to take gymnastics or throw myself out of trees the way Leanne did, hoping to break a bone so she could have a cast and get everyone to sign it like Sarah Harper did in grade five. I know that the day before she disappeared, we talked to a strange man in the park. It's an odd memory, but he only wanted us to help him find his lost dog and we both went home to ask. I wasn't allowed to do that either. The cop knew everything about me. 
He knew I ran relay with Leanne and hurdles. He knew which corner store we stopped at on the way home from school when it was sunny out and we wanted to buy frozen cherry lolas. It was like he'd been watching me and Leanne for months. Questions the police asked me in the middle of the night. Did I say I'd go to Varsity and run track with her and then leave her there alone? Or did she come home with me? Maybe we wanted to have a sleepover and didn't tell anyone. Were we afraid our parents would say no? Was Leanne in my house right now? I was standing in my parents' bedroom in the dark with the curly phone cord wrapped around my wrist. No one put a light on. There were the red numbers shining out of my father's digital alarm clock next to the phone and a couple of skinny stripes of moonlight where the vertical lines didn't match up. I imagined Leanne sitting in my closet, safe in the back shadows like the plate of bread mold, with her knees drawn up high against her chest and her red sneakers still on. No, I told the cop. We didn't see her today. No, we didn't play with her. No. Did you see her at the park? I don't think so. Did you go to the park today? Did you see her in your backyard? No, I, I don't, I don't know. If she's at your house, you're not in trouble. We're trying to find Leanne. We need to know where she is. I didn't see her. Thank you. Wow. Usually get the voice first. So it's usually the first sentence. Um, I think, I. Usually I get the first sentence, and I, the first sentence almost never changes. In fact, I don't think it has ever changed. Like in all the editing that happens, that thing is this real constant for me because I think so much is wrapped up in that first line mm. in terms of who is speaking and, and how that person speaks. But um, So yeah, so I just kind of wait for that to come along. It comes along at weird times, and I just let it sit in the back of my head before I write anything down for a little while. And, and then when it feels like... I should, I do. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is the first line in this? Yeah. Like, um, is, does this fit? This is actually not the first line in the novel because there's a prologue, but I think this is probably the first, I'm trying to think this is the first line I wrote in the book. The first line here is on May 23rd, 1982, the week mm -hmm. after she turned 11, my friend Leanne Gagnon took the subway to St. George Station to practice running the 200 at varsity track and never came home. Um, and that's kind of the book right there, right? Mm -hmm. Because this experience um, is really what the whole book turns on. So everything that's happening in the present day in 1993 mm -hmm. is deeply wrapped up in um, the, the speaker's name is Evie. In, in Edie's experience as a child, right? Um, and her anxiety and, and even the fact that she decides to become a reporter is sort of her way of trying to mitigate this anxiety around bad news. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to remember what, the, there is a prologue. The, the, one of the sub-stories in, in this novel is that Edie becomes convinced that she has a stalker and the prologue actually begins on that note in the real time of the story. The first time, and I know the first line. I bet you that was the first line. The first time I saw him, it was snowing outside. Um, um, so yeah, so it's interesting. Um, but I, I always feel like I, and when I was writing poetry, which I don't really do anymore, um, I was used to get the last line first, and then I have to build the poem backwards because I knew that's where I wanted it to. That's where I wanted to leave the reader. <coughs> Does that answer the question? <laughs> yes, fascinating. Do you, do you have a title for your, book, for your novel? <coughs> um, yeah, the working title is The Devil You Know. The Devil You Know. Okay, yes. Laura yeah. mentioned that. Well, I'll get my mm. That's suggesting. <laughs> I, yeah, I was, the, the original oh, working yeah. title was Speak of the Devil, um, oh. but uh, as it turns out, there was a book published last year called that. So. Mm. <laughs> taken. A, a TV series. Okay. Oh, is there? Oh, well, then it's good that I don't take it. <laughs> but you say this happened, I mean, the incident, yeah. in your book, before Bernardo, um, and before the little girl Holly yes. disappeared that summer? Yeah, yeah, so this, this in, the incident that happens in Evie Jones' life happens in 1982, oh. um, so, which is right, that's sort of the era where Toronto really changes, or at least in the public perception, Toronto changes. I think um, so. It was an interesting mm -hmm. moment in time, and then uh, Bernardo is arrested in February 1993. And of course, it's not until he's arrested that we know. For for those of us, I, mean, I actually was a teenage girl in Toronto in the in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, so for those of us who were that age at that time, and I think perhaps for women who are a bit older as well, if you were in university in 1987 or so. Uh, the Scarborough Rapist mm -hmm. was um, 
loomed very large for all of us. And because it was years um, of these attacks that they knew were related and they never caught anybody. It was sort of horrifying. And it isn't until Bernardo was arrested in 93 for some murders that we realize that this news is released to the world. Actually, it's always been the same guy. This has actually been, this has been the boogeyman since 1985, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what a, I mean, I actually get chills kind of saying that because I sort of remember that the impact of that was monumental. And I, I, I've only recently and I, I sort of have had a bit of trepidation around this subject. You know, are people going to come to me and say, you know, you're writing about violence against women or is this sensational? And it, I can assure you the novel is not sensational. It's actually about the impact on, on, mm -hmm. the, on women, which is about living with fear, ultimately. Um, but, you know, you have all these worries as you're writing something. Is this going to be okay? Um, and all the feedback I've had from women has been completely positive. In fact, mostly what I get are people writing to me and saying, I am so glad, can we finally start talking about this? Can we start talking about what that was like in 1993 when this news hit? Because it was, it was uh, so big for, you know, for women um, who were in the middle of it. Um, and you know, even though I say that, I was in Vancouver a few weeks ago um, just doing some teaching out at UBC and talking to some other people and the subject of the book came up and it was remarkable to me because I because I think of it as a very Ontario thing because that's where I was and that's where Bernardo was, um, and I've talked to women here and in Vancouver who've said, oh, oh no, the impact was huge. It was a sort of a cross-country impact because mm -hmm. the story was so big.